Hi, good evening everyone. Welcome to NHTLH International Training. We are going to go ahead and start with a word of prayer. And our topic of this evening is called the laws of the mind. And if you would um, just go to your screen and you would actually see the presentation as I go through. Both Sister Nash and I are both online. And I will initiate the beginning of the training, and if at any time Sister Nash sees fit, she may jump in and continue or just jump in and give a point. Let's go ahead and start with a word of prayer. Dear kind and merciful Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity to come before you once again. Open our hearts, open our minds. Help us, Lord, that the things that we say will be the things that you want your children to hear. Lead us, guide us, and teach us in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Just want to say welcome, welcome, welcome. As many of you um, that are on the line would have heard, be that you're either in the UK or that you are in Jamaica, either which way, um, you have been following us. We have individuals that are also there. In Trinidad, we have people that are in Canada. We have people that basically um, are all over the world. We have people in the U.S. Um, we may even have some people from Honduras, Panama, um, Africa. So they are, they are people that may join us from different countries around the world, or if not, at the end of the broadcast, the broadcast would go out to these individuals. Let's go ahead and get started with our presentation. It says here, the Lord gave his word to ancient Israel that if they would cleave strictly to him and do all his requirements, he would keep them from all the diseases such as he had brought upon the Egyptians. But this promise was given them the condition of obedience. If you do this, I will do that. It says here, sickness, suffering, and death are the works of an antagonistic power. Satan is the destroyer. God is the restorer. The words spoken to ancient Israel are true today of those who recover health of body or health of soul. It says, I am the Lord that healeth thee. I want to let you know that we do teach from three perspectives. We teach using the Bible inspiration and good science. When we use the word inspiration, we're referring to the writings that have been given to us by our prophetess, Sister Ellen G. White. Given you by far the most advanced, the most aggressive um, teaching in terms of health, healing, and restoration. One of the things that I want you to be aware of is that when sickness and disease comes upon us, it comes because of one of three reasons or multiple reasons. It could be for God's glory. It could be because we violated natural and or spiritual laws, or it could be a combination. I want to let you know that health is spiritual. And the Bible actually teaches that in Numbers chapter 12, um, where the story is told of Miriam, Aaron, and Moses. And just in the event you're not aware of that story, let's give you a quick refresher. Now, you'll find that Miriam, um, and we, we really got to take our time and break this thing down so you understand the position of Miriam. In relationship to God, who was Miriam? Miriam was a prophetess. She was a mouthpiece for God. Let's go Miriam to Aaron and Miriam to Moses. Miriam were the elder sister at the same time also to, because she was the eldest, automatically there is a level of respect that her younger brothers would have given her. Let's go to, to Moses. Who was Moses? 
in relationship to God, Moses was a prophet also. And he was Miriam's um, younger brother. So automatically, you know that there's a level of respect he would have given to her. One of the things that you'll find before I get to Aaron is that many times when Christ is about to use um, individuals, I have seen many times throughout the scripture where he has been able to use the entire family. Okay? So it, it, it's not unusual to see Christ used in both um, Miriam, Aaron, and Moses all at once. And we know that Aaron was the high priest. In relationship to Christ, Aaron was the high priest. In relationship to Moses and Miriam, Aaron was their brother. So you, you, you have a situation here where you're dealing with prophets and prophetess and high priests. You're dealing with mouthpieces of God. And one of the things that we're aware of is that Christ says when he's going to do something, he does not do it unless he reveals it through his servants, the prophets. Now, at the same token, there's a certain way that Christ expects things to be done. It has to be done in decency and in order. And saints, this is deep. In Numbers chapter 12, Miriam begin to backbite. Spiritually, backbiting had a physical manifestation in her caught in a germ. Now, I don't know if you're aware of the fact that leprosy still exists today. The name that is given to leprosy today is actually called Hansen's disease. It is most prevalent in countries that like wild meat or if not countries that eat a lot of pork or they eat an animal by the name of the amadillo. So you'll find that if there are countries that eat pork or the amadillo, there's a bacteria that these two animals literally carry that actually causes leprosy. So one of the things that I would suggest to individuals that are listening to the training this evening, if you're one that likes wild meat, if you're one that likes the Arnold, and, and when I say the Arnold, I'm not talking Brother Kelly. The Arnold um, is referred to the pig. If you're one that likes the pig, my recommendation, leave it alone because both the pig as well as the amadillo carries that bacteria that causes leprosy. As a matter of fact, areas around the world where individual loves to eat pork is where the highest incidence of leprosy um, exists today. Let me give you an example. And, 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 and saints, I am not trying to pick on any specific culture, but they are cultures that really love pork more than any other culture. And as a result, wherever th this culture exists, you'll find a higher level of leprosy within this culture. And I'm talking the Spanish-speaking culture. So the fact that in the Spanish-speaking culture there's a higher incidence of leprosy, that automatically will help me to guide you, to let you know that Florida has one of the highest incidence of leprosy in the world. And then the question is why? Well, Florida has also a very large Spanish population. Let's go on. Arizona in the U.S., Texas in the U.S., California in the U.S. Let's get away from the U.S. a little. Here in Antigua, we actually had a leprosalium, a place where we house lepers. Um, I, I think it's called lepros, uh, um, leprosalium, uh, leprosalium. Um, Sister Nash, maybe you can help with the um, pro proper pronunciation. Um, but I'll make it simple for you. It's a place where lepers actually live. We had such a place here in Antigua. And um, 
we in Antigua, we had a special name for individuals who came down with leprosy. We call it Coco Bay. So as a result, there's a certain area in Antigua that that area was completely blocked off and people with leprosy, they were placed in that specific area in Antigua. Well, in Trinidad, in Tobago, and many of the Caribbean country where they like wild meat. I think the Dominicans and the, the, the St. Vincians and the St. Lucians and um, the, the, the other Spanish speak, French speaking um, countries in the Caribbean, um, I, I think there, there are areas there that they love that wild meat. They love that, um, I think in Trinidad, I think it's Manicou. Um, um, either in a Manico or Tatu, one of the names that Tatu I know, sister. Correct. <laughs> Manico. No, Tatu. Oh, okay, it's Tatu. Ta Tatu is the name. So, um, in Trinidad and Tobago, they call it Tatu. Um, when you go up to um some of the the Spanish-speaking areas that are linked to like South America, you'll also find that the incidence of leprosy is very high again because these individuals, as I mentioned to you, they have a, a, a love for wild meat. So where am I going with all of that? Today, individuals get leprosy. And a physician can give them a vaccination, an antibacterial vaccination, that in no time destroys the virus and get rid of the leprosy. But let me share this with you today. If Miriam was living in today's society, Miriam could have taken all the vaccination in the world, but it would have never gotten rid of that leprosy. And the reason being, the leprosy that Miriam was dealing with was not the one that was caused by eating the, t the tattoo or the armadillo or the Arnold. I'm talking the pig. Miriam's cause of leprosy was backbiting. And saints, as you go through the scripture in Numbers chapter 12, you see what Miriam did. And, and I'm taking my time to blow this thing up because there are people on this line right now. Because I've, I've watched you in the chat group. There are people in our churches right now, be it Adventist, be it Pentecostal, be it whatever church that is out there. Um, there are people in God's church out there that just love to create problems. They love to backbite. They love to gossip. They love to cause issue. And listen what happened. You have Miriam grab a hold of Aaron. And she said, Aaron, stand up here. And then she says, Moses. You, you know, I want you to just kind of picture this, this scenario a little. Wednesday night prayer meeting. Moses is up at the podium giving the Wednesday night program. Miriam and Aaron is in the corner in the back. And Miriam grabbed Aaron and said, Aaron, stand up. And then Miriam, she began to discipline her younger brother publicly at that Wednesday night prayer meeting. And she looks up and she says, Moses, who told you to marry the Ethiopian woman? Doesn't God also speak to us also? Does he only, only speak to you? <coughs> Excuse me. Now, saints, I got a little excited, and I had to mute for a moment there. But let's get back to where we were. So Miriam began to discipline Moses publicly. And watch what happens, saints. The scripture says, you, you, you know, when two individuals, you, you got to remember now, when two individuals come together and they agree, it says the thing is established. 
And you have to look at who was making the statement. You look at the fact that you have a high priest and you have a prophetess. And it says God does nothing unless he reveals it through his servants, the prophet. So as these individuals begin to go back and forth and she begin discipline Moses, watch what happened. The Lord came down. And it says, Miriam, Aaron, Moses, step out of the congregation. Now, saints, you know right off the get-go, judgment is about to take place. And as they step out of the congregation, now, saints, watch how Christ did it. He didn't do it publicly. He pulled them away first. He says, Miriam, listen to this. I have the right to spit in your face. He says, you look, you see my servant Moses? When I, I speak to him, I speak to him mouth to mouth, face to face. You should have been ashamed to open up your mouth against my man's servant. He says, when I speak to you and your boy Aaron, I speak to you guys in dreams and vision. But this man Moses, there's none like him in terms of how we communicate. And saints, if you watch, she came down with leprosy. Now, I shared with you earlier that leprosy is caused by bacteria. But in her case, leprosy was caused by spiritual violation. I'm here to tell you today that there are few of us that are on this line and on this group that will listen to this podcast later. And some of you have been afflicted, not because you eat the arno, not because you eat the armadillo, because the hand of God is resting on you because of that spiritual violation. And let me share this with you. No matter how much vaccination that you'd have gotten, it would not work unless confession of sins, you go before Christ, you go for the individuals you have wronged, and you make things right with the Holy God. Once you do that, you'll find that that situation will be rectified and healing will take place. Am I making sense, dear saints? Saints, I just wanted to take a moment and expound on that section a little. The Bible says in Proverbs 26, verse 2, part B, that the curse causeless shall not come. What shall not come? The curse causeless shall not come. Let's go to the book, Ministry of Healing. Or to some others, it's called Pathways to Health and Happiness. It says that disease never comes without a cause. What never comes without a cause? Disease never comes without a cause. Now, saints, um, do me a favor here. Take that word disease and give me a definition. Because one of the things you want to do, just like you let the scripture interpret itself, let the spirit of prophecy interpret itself. So we're going to take the word disease out and we're going to go on and let the spirit of prophecy interpret itself. Now, what is the definition of disease, someone may ask. We're going back to the same spirit of prophecy and here's the definition that the Lord gives. He says that disease is an effort of nature to free the system from conditions that result from the violation of the laws of health. So right there, we had the spirit of prophecy giving us the interpretation of what disease is. So it says it's an effort of nature to free the system from conditions that result from the violation of the laws of health. So my question for you tonight is, what are the laws of health? Does anybody know? So let's go on. Hear it again. Hear, here it is again. It is given its own interpretation. Pure air, sunlight, abstemiousness. You, you, you know what I mean? We tend to use the word temperance in its place. But the word is abstemiousness, rest, exercise, proper diet, the use of water, trust in divine power. These are the true remedies. 
Now, saints, I want you to pay close attention. It did not say new start. It did not say celebration. You got to remember now that God is a God of order. There's a reason why it has to go in the order it goes. Like, for example, let's go to new start. What does new start start with? Nutrition. Now, let's go ahead and check and see when nutrition comes in. Because you got to remember now, if you put nutrition before people, right away you're going to have some objection. Even within this group that we have right now, by the time you tell them, hey, hold tight on the meat kind. Hold tight on the fish, chicken, turkey, beef, pork, shrimp, lobster, conch, crab, butter, eggs, ice cream, cheese, and animal milk. Hold tight on that. As soon as you tell that, people say, tell you what, see ya. I don't want to be here. They're gone. But if you watch, in the order that the Lord gave it, you have pure ears, sunlight, abstemiousness, rest, exercise, proper diet. So one, two, three, four, five. Proper diet comes six. Of all the eight laws of health, proper diet is number six. So who give us the right to put proper diet as number one when the Lord put it at number six. Saints, let me share this with you. There's a reason for order in terms of the way the Lord outlines his, his information in the spirit of prophecy. Now, let's say someone object to diet. They, 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 they are ones that tend to object to diet. If I tell them when you sleep at night, keep your window slightly ajar, do you think they're going to argue with me? Absolutely not. With all the research that is out right now on vitamin D deficiency and lack of adequate level of sunlight, do you think most people would argue with me? Absolutely not. They may just say one or two words. Oh, maybe I get like a skin cancer, stuff like that. And by the time you show them the research and give them some information, they say, oh, say no more. I, ha I do a program for the white radio station here in Antigua. And I do the, uh, I, uh, on the program that I do every Thursday morning, that's why you guys can hear me this Thursday morning, this past Thursday morning, um, he is a scientist. This is a gentleman who have done major scientific work in the UK. And as he and I began talking about abstemiousness the other day, he says, James, he says, my mom, uh, you know, my mom, my family, she, my mom always talking about the temperance pledge. There were temperance groups all throughout the UK where they would sign pledges and they would abstain from eating certain things and different things along that line. So when I told him that we teach about the temperance pledge, we teach about the things that are good, you do in moderation, and the things that are bad, you leave alone. He got so excited because it reminded him of the temperance pledge that his mom used to adhere to as a child when he was growing up. And you got to remember now that this gentleman is a scientist, and most scientists do not believe in God. But as I start talking about abstemiousness, he began getting excited because it's something that he could relate to from when he was small. Rest. You tell the average person, man, you need to go to sleep on time. No stress, no argument. You tell me like an exercise. No stress. By the time you would have won them and all five of those initial laws, by the time you get to pure, um, proper diet, they say it makes all the sense in the world. But if you put nutrition right at the front, immediately you have problems. Now, you have some other individuals now that would actually want to go ahead and put Jesus right up front. Saints, watch me here now. If you put Jesus right up front, you're going to have some problems again too. Because not even Jesus put himself right up front. Look where Jesus put himself. He put himself last. And why did he put himself last? Because if you listen to the scripture, it says, These are they which testify of me. So follow me. You see all those laws of health that comes before trust in divine power? The Bible says, these are they which testify of me. So they are all testifying 
of Jesus Christ. Because one of the things that you'll find is that what individuals will do and say, they will say, listen, if this individual can use these simple remedies and heal me, could it be that they might be right on their position on the scriptures and who Christ is? Come on, saints, am I making sense here? So one of the things that you want to do is that you need to follow the pattern man. And as you follow the pattern man, you'll find that the pattern man healed more people. And then after he healed them, he said, follow me. He didn't say follow me initially. He, excuse me, he met their needs. And after meeting their needs, he said, follow me. And saying, I recommend that we all follow the pattern man. So, just to make sure you don't get me wrong, I am not saying leave Christ out of nothing. Christ has to be in everything. However, there's a way that Christ does things, and we need to watch the order at which he does it. You'll find that many people want to put trust in divine power first, because they feel you have to trust in divine power. When technically speaking, if you watch the writings in terms of how the Lord laid out the laws of, the, of, of health, he did not put trust in divine power number one. He put pure ear number one. Trust in divine power he put last because you'll find that as people begin to trust that which you're sharing with them, it will be easy to guide them to the Savior. Am I making sense here, saying? Um, I, I hope you see the direction we're going here. The first thing to be done is to ascertain the true character of the sickness and then go to work intelligently to remove the cause. If the harmonious working of the system has become unbalanced either by overwork, overeating, or other irregularities, do not endeavor to adjust the difficulties by adding a burden of poisonous medicine. Saints, this is deep right here. It says, do not endeavor to adjust the difficulties by adding a burden of poisonous medicine. Now, some of us may stay up late at night, and all of a sudden, you start getting a little sneezy here, sneezy there, or you start getting a little headache. And as soon as you get that headache, you want to go and take a, a Panadol, you want to go and take an aspirin. But what we're going to do, we're going to take our moment and show you what are the side effects of just taking a basic aspirin or basic Panadol when technically speaking, just a, little, um, just a little water or a foot bath would have solved the problem without any side effects. What should I do if I get sick? We are told that in case of sickness, the cause should be ascertained. Unhelpful conditions should be changed. Wrong habits corrected, then nature is to be assisted in her effort. The use of natural remedies requires an amount of key and effort that many are not willing to give. Nature's process of healing and upbuilding is gradual, and to the impatient it seems slow. The surrender of hurtful indulgences requires sacrifice, but in the end, it will be found that nature untremored. What does the word untremored mean? It means leave her alone. And you'll find that she will do her work how? Wisely and well. Now, saints, follow me here. If you get a cut, and your hand, and you clean that cut, you keep it clean, will the cut heal on its own? The answer is yes. The way the Savior designed the human body, the, the human body has the ability to heal itself when placed in the right condition. Okay? So um, that's, that's, what it, when, that's what it means when it says that in the end, it will be found that nature, Nature untremble, nature left alone, will do her work wisely and well. Nature has the ability to heal herself on her own. Let's continue here. Too little attention is generally given to the preservation of health. It is far better to prevent disease than to know how to contract it. It is far better to prevent disease than to know how to treat it when contracted. Let's go to aspirin. 
When you look at aspirin, just a basic aspirin, look at this thing. Just, just that basic over-the-counter aspirin, nothing difficult, nothing challenging. What risk do you run? Constipation, ulcer, ringing in the ear, hemorrhage within the skull, stomach cramps, diarrhea, heartburn, feel like throwing up, throwing up, taste problem, um, irritation of the stomach and intestines. Let, let, let's go again. Um, stomach ulcers, hepatitis, kidney stone, itching, hives, seizures, wheezing, breathing, life-threatening allergic reaction. Say, let me share this with you if you, you don't know this. Do you know that the people who write these side effects, they actually go to school to figure out which words to put up there to cause the least negative reaction when you read it. So watch this. Life-threatening allergic reaction. You know what that means? It means death. You know, life-threatening, it's death is basically what it means. So it's just to kind of give you some heads up of just taking aspirin. A rupture in the wall of the stomach or intestine. Saying, when technically speaking, all you had to do was just a foot bat, um, a hot foot bat for 20 minutes, and the headache is gone. Sometimes it might be dehydration. You're not drinking enough water, and the headache is gone, rather than you going and taking these things. So the question is asked, do drugs cure disease? The answer is no. Drugs never cure disease. They only change its form and location. When drugs are introduced into the system, for a time they seem to have a beneficial effect. A change may take place, but the disease is not cured. It will manifest itself in some other form. The disease which a drug was given to cure may disappear, but only to reappear in a new form, such as skin disease, ulcers, painful disease joints, and sometimes in a more dangerous and deadly form. Nature keeps struggling, and the patients suffer with different ailments until there's a sudden breaking down in her effort and death follows. Brother Luke? Yes, please. Hi. I just wanted to, um, to make a point there um, with the aspirin. It is something that um, is so toxic to the body uh, that when injected, it actually causes uh, some chemicals to be formed within the gut, the intestines, and that gets leaked out into the bloodstream, thereby irritating, as we saw, you know, the kidney, the stomach, and other um, parts of the body. And uh, the liver actually um, do not detoxify um, chemicals such as phenol, and um, we have also formaldehyde that can come about um, from use of these items. So it is, you know, not something that should be taken lightly, uh, but rather, you know, let's seek to, um, you know, avoid the use of aspirin, especially, you know, for the simple things that individual would quickly want to run to use this uh, drug medication for um, when there are other natural remedies that would not be harmful to the body. Okay, amen. Okay, so let's go right ahead and continue. And Sister Nash, we're right now at the beginning of the laws of the mind. So at any given time, please jump in. If there's any law that you really like that, you know, you, you want to talk on, please do not hesitate because I know from time to time there might be specific laws that gets you a little excited and it's something that you may want to talk about. The Ten Laws of the Mind. Saints, they are laws that governs the human machinery. The question is, do you know what they are? Let's get started. It says, it is the duty of every person for his own sake and for the sake of humanity to inform himself in regard to the laws of life and conscientiously to obey them. It is the duty of every person for his own sake 
and for the sake of humanity to inform himself in regard to the laws of life and conscientiously to obey them. All should study the influence of the mind upon the body and of the body upon the mind and the laws by which they are governed. Law number one. It is the law of the mind that it will narrow or expand to the dimension of the thing with which it becomes familiar. It is the law of the mind that it will narrow or expand to the dimension of the thing with, with which it becomes familiar. Let's continue. It says the mental powers will surely become contracted and will lose the ability to grasp the deep meaning of the word of God unless they are put vigorously and persistently to the task of searching for truth. If occupied with commonplace matters only, it will become dwarfed and enfeebled. If never required to grapple with difficult problems, it will after a time almost lose the power of growth. So saints, one of the things you'll find is that while you're doing this medical missionary work, we're not just going to give you things easy. You have to grapple with difficult problems. And as you grapple with the difficult problems and you struggle, this is what causes the mind to expand, to enlarge, to get bigger. As a matter of fact, I watched Dr. Lamley um, assisted a group of people this evening in terms of menu planning and food combination. I remember when Sister Nash and I began studying that. That took us 10 years to study. Menu planning and food combination took us 10 years. Say, let me share this with you. If you listen to the menu planning and food combination that Sister Nash, myself, and Dr. Lamley and Brother Taylor, um, um, Sister Kimmy and Brother Farley, Sister Michelle um, out of the UK, and everyone that's going to be teaching that topic, listen good. You would have never, ever, ever heard that topic taught by anyone else. And the reason being is because many people, the, 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 the line they follow is totally different than the line we follow. The line that Sister Nash, myself, and the rest of the team follow, we use the Bible, the spirit of prophecy, and good science to harmonize with how we are teaching. So you'll find that the approach that we take is a total different approach than anything you'd have ever heard in terms of menu planning and food combination because of the approach that we have taken. We have taken a biblical approach on that topic. And so our presentation is unlike any others that you have ever seen on menu planning and food combination. Let's continue. It says, in the word of God, the mind, oh, before I continue, I got to tell you this. When Sister Nash and I were studying that menu plan and food combination, you know what happened to us sometimes? We had information that was at least 150 or 60 years before its time. So what we would have to do, as we read these items in the spirit of prophecy, we would have to wait a year or two or more for science to catch up with that which we had already studied in the spirit of prophecy. And by the time the science um, caught up, that's when we were able to pick up and then continue on. But we had the information, we just needed to wait until science get caught up with the Bible and spirit of prophecy in order for us to move on. I, I just want to interject here too um, that you know we've been talking and teaching uh, that we should steam the coarse vegetables until tender uh, before we consume them and um, it was just towards the end of last year when we were doing a um, joint when we joined the webinar that when um, the individual uh, was speaking about the small intestinal bacteria overgrowth, uh, she mentioned then and insisted that 
vegetables, all vegetables needed to be steamed until tender to as part of the healing process um, in overcoming SIBO. And, um, you know, I, I just smiled and said, wow, there you go. We've been teaching that years before. And, um, you know, just towards the end of last year, about it was December, um, when I heard it um, from out in the public circles for the first time. Okay. <laughs> Sister Nash, you're so correct. And Sister Nash, and, and if you listen to a lot of people, they're like, let's go raw. Let's go all raw. Now, if you find that the way we're doing this all raw with NCUFM here in Jamaica, it's different than any other all raw program that is being done out there. The thing about most people who do the all raw, they do not have the spirit of prophecy and the guidance and the scientific data for over the past 160 years to support whatever position they are taking. And we have that position. We have the data. We know that the position that we have taken is the correct position because we have studied the pattern, man. We have studied the pattern that have laid down by the Seventh-day Adventist Church of old. And that's why today the Seventh-day Adventist people that practice the laws of health Bar none are considered the healthiest people on the face of the earth. And saints, please, I'm not saying this to be arrogant or cocky or anything like that, because that's not how you present God's message. That type of spirit is not the spirit of Christ. So I will never say it from that perspective. I am saying it in a way to state a scientific fact and a fact that is consistent with the Bible and spirit of prophecy. So I just thought I'll put that out there. So as individuals are currently listening or may listen to the podcast, they may say, why is this guy speaking like that? Well, saints, let me share this with you. When you know something is true, when you have all of the supporting data to support the position you're taking, you can speak with power. And by God's grace, that is the way that Sister Nash and I, as well as the rest of the team, will be speaking as you listen to our presentations. Okay, let's continue here. It says in the Word of God, the mind finds subject for the deepest thought, the loftiest aspiration. In the reverent contemplation of the truths presented in his word, the mind of the student is brought into communion with the infinite mind. Such a study will not only refine and ennoble the character, but it cannot fail to expand and invigorate the mental powers. Law number two. God designed that man shall not decide from impulse, but from weight of evidence. <laughs> Saints, I, I, I love this right here, you, you know. It's simple, but it makes all the sense of, in the world. You know, Saints, I want, l let me repeat it one more time so you get it. God designed that man shall not decide from impulse, but from weight of evidence. See, this is, the, this is the Bereans. This is speaking about the Bereans right here. This is Bereans um, teaching. What are we saying, saints? As Sister Nash, myself, Brother Kelly, and all of the teachers that are expounding this message to you. And I heard a gentleman, I think Brother Kevin tonight, talk about it. Before you respond to us, my recommendation is to take your time and study it first. Get, gather all the information, gather all the data, go back and check the sources, go back and check the Bible, the spirit of prophecy first, and then you get science that is in harmony with the Bible and spirit of prophecy before you say that information is wrong. 
or you want to correct or you want to edit the information because you have gone to the world first before you have gone to Christ first. Now, saints, one of the things you may want to find is that the scripture tells us that God is a jealous God. And he is truly a jealous God. His intention is to give us everything our heart desire. But he's going to give it to us in a way that brings honor and glory to him. As a matter of fact, I remember reading a quote in, in the Spirit of Prophecy a while back that if Christ has, if we ask him for something and he has to say no, says he counterbalanced it with something else. You know, and the counterbalance is that he gives you something better than what you'd have asked for in the beginning. I'm saying this, Sister Nash, were you going to say something? No, and, um, I, that statement is so true. I mean, it's a statement that you read, but I've seen um, in my own life where that is so true. Sometimes even that which we ask for not, um, or not for, that the Lord blesses us with, you know, in remarkable ways and um, we can only just sit back and enjoy the blessing. A amen. So remember this. God wants you to make your decisions based on what? Weight of evidence, not impulse. So I want you, for the ones that are going through the medical missionary training with Sister Nash, myself, and the rest of the team, you can listen to what we are teaching. And you can listen to any other things that's out there. But one of the things that you'll find, you'll, you, in the end, you'll say, you know something? That program that NCU and Sister Nash and Brother Luke and the rest of the team put on, they really gave the all. They, they really put us in a position to prepare us for heaven by God's grace. And then one of the things you can use is that once you get this solid foundation, you're able to utilize any other teaching out there and one of the things you can also do too is that sometimes some of our teachers have gone to the world before they have gone to Christ. So one of the things you may end up having to do is to bring them back and reconcile them unto a holy God. It says, it is not the plan of God to compel men to yield their wicked unbelief. Before them are light and darkness, truth and error. It is for them to decide which is to accept. The human mind is endowed with power to discriminate between right and wrong. Saints, I love this quote right here. The human mind is endowed with power to discriminate between right and wrong. Saints, there might be individuals, not they might, there will be individuals that will be in heaven that have never heard of Christ before. And they are going to be learning about Christ while they're there in heaven. And he'll say, hey, how did you guys make it? Right here. Because they lived up to all the light that they were able to live up to at that time. So saints, let me give you an example. There are some of you that are with us right now doing this program. And some of you are deliberately cheating. Uh, some of you are not following the, the way you should. Some of you are not even taking your time to read the material. And as a result, you're just doing the program some helter-skelter way. And as a result, you run into some challenges, some difficulty. And then you give a bad report or a bad testimony when technically speaking, you have not taken the time to properly equip yourself. Okay? And, and that is wrong because the way the human mind is designed it has the ability to discriminate between right and wrong. And as information, as truth is being placed before you, your heart will tell you, you know something, this is a little different than that which I've ever heard before. There is something special going on right here, right now. Number three, it is the law of nature that our thoughts and feelings are encouraged and strengthened as we give them utterance. So saints, this tells you right, right off the get-go, 
for individuals who like to speak negative, guess what? It affects their thoughts. It affects their emotions. People who like to speak positive, you're going to find it affects them also too. Like, for example, yesterday we had one of the most devastating things that happened to us at the store. But praise the Lord. Since, you know what I mean, you see, I came, I was high spirit. Um, I went ahead uh, and I said, blessed be the name of the Lord. And we went ahead and we still open our restaurant today. We still open up the health food store today. And we did amazing. As a matter of fact, I got to tell you, we were getting ready to set up the shape of pans. And we end up having to dump all of the shape of pans that we had. And we still had some brand new ones put aside in a box. And I asked Chef, I said, Chef, check the box out for me, see how many we have. Chef checked it. She said, Brother Luke, we only have two. So I said, well, we need to go ahead and get some more and kind of get, you know, to get functional for today. So this was um, last night when we were leaving. This morning, um, we got a call from the store um, uh, one of the young lady calls us and tell us, oh, by the way, I have the shape of pans all set up. And we said, how many pans do you have? She says, I have three. I said, where did you get the third one from? She says, in the box, one of them was a double. Says, let me tell you, you, you know, I oh. said, blessed be the name of the Lord, even in the midst of crisis. You can see the hand of God still working and still trying to bless us as much as he can, although he allowed what he allowed to take place. You know what I mean? Because one of the things you got to remember as, as a man and woman of God, nothing can take place on earth unless permission is given in heaven. Anything that takes place on earth, no that God himself has weighed it twice. I remember reading a quote in Spirit of Prophecy. It says, he actually weighs the temptation that he allows to come to us twice before he allows it to come to you. So imagine this. The infinite God of heaven is double-checking himself. So I said, blessed be the name of the Lord. And since we went ahead and then Chef came up with a creative way where we did not have to go out and um, make any purchases today. We were able to um, transport some of the things that we had at the home um, and got it rectified at the store. And I got to tell you guys, remember I told you that the home was flooded out? We figured out what happened in the home. Remember I told you guys I had just moved to the home. Well, the way these guys wired one of the pipe, it's a weird setup. It's an upstairs and downstairs home. If you go into the shower and turn on the hot water, it turns on a pipe in the kitchen. So after turning on the pipe, the hot water pipe in the, the bathroom... It actually turned on, and you got to remember, there's no hot water. You know, my home doesn't have hot water, but, you know, the section that normally hot water would go, when I turn that on, it automatically turns on the pipe, so water will come up from downstairs. So, um, blessed be the name of the Lord. Um, one of the, the cooks that came today, um, I, I, I was taking a shower, and she ran and said, hey, 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 guess what? Something's going on. And by time that we figured out what was taking place, it was as you turn the shower on, the hot water, the water would come up. So that's where the flooding took place in the home. So guess what? Able to solve the problem at the store last night, able to get everything running this morning, got home, the house is flooded, able to solve it this morning. And by God's grace comes Sabbath. What a lovely way to enjoy Sabbath. You know, all of these issues are just rectified and solved right before Sabbath. Let's continue. While words express thoughts, it is also true that thoughts follow words. 
if we would give more expression to our faith, rejoice more in the blessing that we know we have the great mercy and love of God, we should have more faith and greater joy. No tongue can express, no finite mind can conceive the blessings that result from appreciating the goodness and love of God. Even on earth, we may have joy as a wellspring never failing because fed by the streams that flow from the throne of God. Oh, I love this one. Number four. This is one of my favorite. It says here, it is an important law of the mind. Saints, do me a favor. I got to go slow with this one. I get, kind of, I get kind of excited when I read this. So, you know, have mercy in me and praise the Lord that I'm not speaking to Brother Kelly because you guys would have heard Elder Kelly, Brother Kelly, Elder Kelly, Brother Kelly probably a hundred times, you know, but praise the Lord I'm not speaking to him tonight. So I'm able to just take my time by God's grace and just work through the stick. And his Sister Nash was on the line dialoguing with me you to hear Sister Nash, Sister Nash, Sister Nash. But well, praise the Lord. Um, we, we, we are dialoguing minimally so you don't hear her name being called so many times. L let me share this about number four. Number four is so sweet. Listen, listen to number four. And if you're wondering where these laws come from, they come from like ministry of healing, mind, character, and personality. They are coming from these writings. Listen to what it says here. It says it is an important law of the mind that when a desired object is so firmly denied as to remove all hope, the mind will soon cease to long for it and will be occupied in other pursuits. But as long as there is any hope of gaining the desired object, an effort will be made to obtain it. Oh, that is so sweet. Saints, you, you, you got to understand how the human mind is designed, how it works. L listen to, l let me just repeat that one more time, and I'll tell you a story. It says it's an important law of the mind that when a desired object is so firmly denied as to remove all hope, the mind will soon cease to long for it and be occupied in other pursuits. But as long as there is any hope of gaining the desired object, an effort will be made to obtain it. Now, saints, I've watched relationships and I've watched certain individuals break up. They get back together, break up, get back together. Or you may see a relationship where someone is abusive. And you wonder why the person stays in such an abusive relationship. And then finally, all of a sudden, you see the person break loose. And you wonder, how did they get loose this time when they were not able to get loose before? You know, and it takes you to the scripture where it talks about where the evil angels will come back and check to see if the home is being swept. You know, like when you overcome a situation, they'll come back and see if the home is being swept. And if the home is not being swept, normally they come back with other demons, other vices, where the second situation will be worse than the first, right? Same situation here. You'll find that when you're in a situation if you deny it and you say, hey, listen, it is over, don't come back again, that's it. You remove all hope. Since you know that person will never come back again. Sometimes what they may do, they may swing by to see if the home is swept one more time. And if when they come by the second time to see if the home is swept and they realize that there's no hope, they go on their way and they never return again. But if when they come by to see if the home is swept and he kind of like, hey, you know, kind of play around a little and stuff like that, 
guess what? Right off the get-go, they realize that you have not firmly denied them as to remove all hope. And as a result, an effort will be made uh, to obtain that desired situation. It's the same thing with smoking. You may find somebody has smoked for 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, and one morning they get up and they said, that's it. And you wonder, how can this person be held in bondage for 40 years, 50 years, and just get up and just want, stop it one time? Law of the mind number four. It is an important law of the mind that when a desired object is so firmly denied as to remove all hope, the mind will soon cease to long for it. I'll be occupied in other pursuits. But as long as there is any hope of gaining the desired object, an effort will be made to obtain it. It says great harm is done by a lack of firmness and decision. I have known parents to say, you cannot have this or that, and then relent, thinking that they may be too strict and give the child the very thing they at first refuse. A lifelong injury is thus inflicted. Number five, the consciousness of right doing is the best medicine for disease, body, and mind. You know, you, you see that consciousness of right doing? It, it, I, I often wonder why the U.S. government, the IRS, have a donation site. Because one of the things that they have found is that many times people who cheat the IRS, the conscience bothers them so much that they normally would want to find a way of outlet to correct that situation, but they know that if they go to the IRS, they may go to jail. So one of the things that the IRS do, they give an option that someone can go on the site and give a donation. And many times you'll find that individuals who go on and give thousands upon thousands of dollars of donation trying to make things right for that which they, they, they cheated. So the, it says here, number five, the consciousness of right doing is the best medicine for diseased bodies and diseased mind. I, I remember uh, I was just um, listening to a story the other day, and there's a young lady who, um, she killed her husband, and she got away clean, scot-free, clean. But after she killed him, it bothered her, and she became an alcoholic. And she decided to join... Alcoholic Anonymous. While she was in Alcoholic Anonymous, she met this young man and they began dating. And while they are dating and different things and having a great time, she decided to confess that which she had done um, while she was under the influence. He then went on and reported the crime and she was convicted and was put away. So one of the things that you'll find about number five is that many times you get something called debt bed confession. I remember another story existed the other day where a gentleman was on his debt bed. Everyone thought he was going to die. And he ended up confessing to a crime that he had done. And lo and behold, he recovered. And after he recovered, he tried to recant. But unfortunately, it was too late. Um, they did go ahead and persecute him for that crime. Um, I remember we were doing a consultation. Now, saints, this is deep. And while doing the consultation, a young lady, in the midst of the consultation, shared with us that she had actually killed her husband. And saints, I know many of you guys that are listening right now probably want to know what we did or what we say. And saints, I am not telling you what we did. Amen? So please do not ask. But 
the situation was rectified by God's grace, but I'm not telling you what we did. So it says here, the consciousness of right doing is the best medicine for disease bodies and disease mind. Isaiah 58 verse 8, and thine health shall spring forth speedily. Thine health shall spring forth speedily. It says here, the special blessing of God resting upon the receiver is health and strength. Oh, I love this quote right here. Listen to this. This is a sweet quote. A person whose mind is quiet and satisfied in God is in the pathway to health. Saints, my question for you this evening, is your mind quiet and satisfied in God? You'll find that many times people go to bed at night and they can't sleep. Why? The mind is not quiet. The mind is not quiet and satisfied in God. Got to get that mind quiet. To have the consciousness that the eye of the Lord is upon us and that his ear is open to our prayer is satisfaction indeed. To know that we have a never-failing friend to whom we can confide all the secrets of the soul is a happiness which words can never express. Number six, very simple. Idleness weakens brain power. Idleness weakens brain power. Now, saints, let me tell you something. That's why you don't catch me playing games like dominoes and worry and, and, and board games and, and stuff like that. You, you don't catch me doing those stuff. Um, as a matter of fact, I don't even have a television in my home. You, you know, uh, th th there's so much studying to do to help people. There's so much more time. Um, there, there's souls that are dying, souls that need help, that I don't have time for those type of situations. So number six is that idleness weakens brain power. It says here the reason why the youth have so little strength of brain and muscle is because they do so little in the line of useful labor. Behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom. Pride, fullness of bread, and abundance of idleness was in her and in her daughter. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and the needy. And they were haughty and committed abomination before me. Therefore, I took them away as I saw good. Number seven. Irregular hours of eating and irregular hours of sleeping sap the brain forces. Thanks. If you want to start losing memory, if you want to start losing your ability to retain and remember things, eat at odd times and go to bed at odd times. And I want to tell you, it's a law that governs the mind that it will sap the brain forces. The mental powers will surely become contracted and will lose the ability to grasp the deep meaning of the word of God unless they put vigorously and persistently to the task of searching for truth. Oh my goodness. This is sweet. Now, saints, we're going into the big boys. We're going into the heavy hitters right here. Listen good now. Number eight, let the will, let the what? Let the will be kept awake and rightly directed, and it will impart energy to the whole being and will be a wonderful aid in the maintenance of health. Listen good, saints. Let the what? Let the will be kept what? Awake and rightly directed. And it will impart energy to the whole being and will be a wonderful aid in the maintenance of health. Listen to this. The power of the will is not valued as it should be. It is a power also in dealing with disease. Exercise in the right direction 
it will control the imagination and will be a potent means of resisting and overcoming disease of both mind and body by the exercise of the willpower in placing themselves in the right relation to life. Patients can do much to cooperate with the physician's effort for their recovery. They are thousands who can recover health if they will. That's why Sister White says 90% of all diseases begin in the mind. I remember the story is being told. Two men, they went to a hospital and one had terminally ill cancer and the one was just absolutely healthy. But while they were there at the hospital, their records got crossed. The one that was terminally ill, they accidentally told him that he was healthy. And the one that was healthy, they accidentally told him that he was terminally ill. And they sent both men home. And months later, when they realized what they had done, the first thing they did is that the man who was terminally ill, they called. And they said, Mr. So-and-so, can you come in? We'd like to do a follow-up and just check things out to see how you're doing. Now, saints, listen to me. The terminally ill man, when he came and they checked him, he had completely reversed his end-stage cancer and was living a healthy lifestyle now. The man who was totally healthy, when they finally called him, they could not reach him. Why? They found out that he had died between the time that they had sent him home and the time that they had already tried to reach him. Why am I saying this? It has to do with the will. Since I have watched people over and over the day before, I'm talking to them, and they're strong like a bull. Strong, healthy, you know what I mean, just normal, just doing ex everything. They go to the doctor the next day, do a physical. The doctor tells them they have something, maybe cancer or whatever it is. And then by the time they come back and I see them a day later, you know, oh, oh. I said, what happened? Oh. You, you know what I mean? All of a sudden, they have pain that they never had before. They have moaning and groaning that they never had before. And since this is what happened to the will, it has to do with the mind. It says the power of the will is not valued as it should be. It is a power also in dealing with disease. It says exercise in the right direction, it will control the imagination and be a potent mean of resisting and overcoming disease of both mind and body. <coughs> Excuse me. Am I making sense, these things? Let's continue. Number nine. I love this. I didn't know it was a sin until I began reading this. Number nine. They should discipline their minds to be retentive. Since you didn't hear me tonight here. It says here, they should discipline their minds to be retentive. The Lord says, hey, all of you guys out there, you guys need to start Retaining things in your mind. You can't come up with an excuse and say, I forget. You need to discipline your mind to be retentive. Listen to this. Disciplined minds have increased powers of retention. Habits of negligence should be resolutely overcome. Many think it's a sufficient excuse for the gross... <coughs> 
excuse me, for the grossest error to plead forgetfulness. Excuse me. But do they not, as well as others, possess intellectual faculties? Then they should discipline their minds to be retentive. Now, saints, listen to this. It is a sin to forget, a sin to be negligent. If you form a habit of negligence, you may neglect your own soul salvation and, and at least find that you are unprepared, you're unready for the kingdom of God. Let's repeat that one more time. Discipline minds have increased powers of retention. Habits of negligence should be resolutely overcome. Many think it a sufficient excuse for the grossest error to plead forgetfulness. But do they not, as well as others, possess intellectual faculties? Then they should discipline their minds to be retentive. It is a sin to forget. A sin to be negligent. If you form a habit of negligence, you may neglect your own soul salvation and at last find that you're unready for the kingdom of God. Wow. Wow. Say, I remember when I first read that, I got scared. Because, you know, I find that from time to time, I may not remember everything. So, I just start making sure, saints, that I start memorizing, I start retaining, and that's why many times all of my presentation, I can probably tell you for the most part, I may have most of them memorized. Evil angels are thriving. This is number 10. For the dominion of every human being, whatever injures the health not only lessens physical vigor, but tends to weaken the mental and moral powers. Intellig indulgence in any unhelpful practice make it more difficult for one to discriminate between right and wrong, and hence more difficult to resist evil. It increases the danger of failure and defeat. Saints, did you hear that? You, you, you hear how the human mind works? Listen good. Indulgence in any unhelpful practice makes it more difficult for one to discriminate between right and wrong, and hence more difficult to resist evil. It increases the danger of failure and defeat. Now, saints, listen good. Here's how this thing works. First time you go up to bat, you need to just hit a home run. You need to just hit the thing for six. One time. You can't just sit around and play around. Meaning that when you change your diet, you can't go back and eat the old ways. That's why by God's grace, since I've changed my diet, I can come before God's children and tell you never once have I gone back and consume any flesh product. I have stayed on the course by God's grace. And let me tell you what I've done. Saints, I've made other errors in life, but I can tell you I've never once by God's grace um, gone out on my diet. And, but I'll tell you what I've done. Because I've overcome by God's grace on the dietary aspect, what I've been able to do is when I struggle in other areas of my life, I go back to the diet and I use the diet as a bench, as a benchmark, and say, no, saints, if I was able to overcome here, I'm going to use this as the pattern to overcome in other areas of life. That's why Sister White says in the Spirit of Prophecy, if you can overcome appetite, by God's grace, he can overcome every sin in this world. Now, saints, as we come to a close here, listen to this. This is deep. Listen to this. I'm, I'm closing down here. It says, pure 
helpful reading will be to the mind what health food is to the body. So saints, let me take this to another level. Pure helpful reading, pure helpful seeing, pure helpful listening will be to the mind what health food is to the body. You will thus des- become stronger to resist temptation, to form right habits, and to act upon right principles. Saints, listen, we're building as we close here. God, the avenues of the soul. We have a work to do to resist temptation. Those who would not fall prey to Satan's device, devices must guard well the avenues of the soul. They must avoid reading, seeing, or hearing that which will suggest impure thoughts. The mind should not be, the mind should not be left to wander at random upon every subject that the adversary of souls may suggest. You know, saints, we can get a little deeper here, you know what I mean? This is why we don't get into yoga. We just leave the mind blank and open for anything to come and take over the mind. We don't practice yoga. We don't get into yoga. We don't leave the mind blank. The mind needs to be occupied with heavenly things. They which run in a race run all, but one receive it the price. In the warfare in which we engage, all may win who will discipline themselves by obedience to the right principles. The practice of these principles in the details of life is too often looked upon as unimportant, a matter too trivial to demand attention. But in view of the issues at stake, nothing with which we have to do is small. Every act casts its weight into the scale that determines life's victory or defeat. The scripture bids us, so run that ye may obtain. As the flower turns to the sun, that the bright beams may aid in perfecting its beauty and symmetry. So should we turn to the sun of righteousness, that heaven's light may shine upon us, that our character may be developed into the likeness of Christ. Amen. Saints, we have come to the end of this presentation, so I'm just going to go ahead and turn off the recording. Um, and then we will open it up for Q&A.